Oh, good morning, everybody. We've got people starting to arrive now. Good. So we're just uh, actually one minute past nine now. So uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to this SBN meeting on the sustainable and circular economy. So it's uh, all part of Winchester Green Week. If you haven't been catching up with their events all week, um, you've still got a couple more days to go. And the, uh, the programme is on the Winchester Green Week website. So do have a look at that and see what other things are coming up later today and tomorrow. And I believe there are some in-person events happening at the weekend in Winchester itself. Uh, I'm hoping everybody can hear me because I seem to have lost my little in with window in my little picture of everybody on my screen. So hopefully you've got our uh, programme there in front of you. Uh, quite an interesting programme this morning on the circular economy. So we're quite excited to have uh, Dr Frey here from the University of Southampton um, to give us the overview of the circular economy and then a case study from circular computing, looking at actually what does it mean in practice and what sort of products can you buy and uh, hopefully showing that they are as good as new products. Uh, as always, we are interested in your feedback from these events. So there's a QR code there you can uh, scan. Uh, if you've got your phone handy and uh, drop us some feedback as we go. Very interested to hear, obviously, on the individual speakers and the content and also what uh, other topics you might like to hear about in the future. So if you've got your phone handy, do have a go at that one. I will leave it on the screen for another 10 or 15 seconds. So hopefully everyone's attacking it really quickly. How long does it take to get a phone out? Hang on. If I do it myself, I'll know that you've had long enough. Right, I've done it, therefore hopefully everybody else has. Um, also want to mention the uh, next event coming up in our series for the autumn. Uh, so this is on uh, biodiversity and we've got speakers from Vitabice and Hampshire and White Wildlife Trust talking about biodiversity and what you can do um, locally to your business or home uh, to help support biodiversity in your region, as well as the work that they do um, across the land that they manage. So that should be a really interesting talk. And again, QR code there if you want to go straight to the website now. Um, but the all the details are on the um, Sustainable Business Network pages of the Carbon Trust web, Carbon Footprints website. Uh, so you can look us up online as well. And there will be more plus publicity coming out nearer the time. So that should be a very exciting event then. Um, also, just wanted to mention, uh, we're just uh, holding a climate assembly meeting in Winchester Guild Hall on Saturday, the 22nd of October. And this is to help inform Winchester's net zero drive and to meet their targets of uh, net zero for the district uh, by 2030. So they're looking to get input from both residents and businesses. So if you're a business based in the Winchester district, um, then do sign up for that event and come along and give your opinion on you know, what you think needs to be done to support you in your drive to um, net zero and what you think the district should be doing in terms of the wider community uh, and getting to everyone to net to zero. So if you've got the spare time on the 22nd, then the link is there again, and these slides will be available on the website at the end, so you can go and look that one up. Um, but they are looking for impact, input from all sorts of people, whether they're residents, businesses, they live in Winchester or they work in Winchester, but live somewhere else and they're traveling in. Anybody with a connection with Winchester, they're interested in hearing uh, your views. Uh, so I think that's all I have to say. Uh, so I will ask Pete to grab the screen and start his legal update. Thanks, Duncan. Um, good morning, everyone. So yeah, I'm here to do the, the legal update. Um, I won't take up much of your time today uh, because there aren't a huge number of legal updates that are particularly pertinent. Uh, to uh, businesses that have been outlined since the last time we held uh, an SBN update. So I'll just go through a couple of examples, but what I've tried to also do uh, for this morning, just to kind of get us in the uh, mindset of sort of circular economy, is just highlight a few items of legislation that have been brought in that are aligning with circular economy principles and trying to support um, and encourage the approach towards a circular economy as well. So I'll cover those off. But just to start in brief with uh, a couple of very random examples of some of the legislation that has been um, uh, published and updated uh, over the last couple of months since the last update. Um, first has been around medium combustion plant uh, directives. So there's been a, an update on some of the emission limit values for gas engines. 
the um, MCPD, the Medium Combustion Plant Directive, is basically aimed at emissions limits for uh, different types of plant over a certain size within um, uh, buildings and infrastructure. So it sets limits on the amount of emissions that can be emitted. So uh, that has just been some update to the, the values uh, for different types of the uh, facilities there. Uh, the Beavers England order, always good to see that there is a, a sort of a species specific uh, order coming through. So this uh, adds the Eurasian beaver uh, as a European protected species under the Bern Convention. Um, it was already uh, given sort of protected status um, under just sort of different annexes, but this um, essentially means that there can't be any um, sort of population culling that's kind of put in place around uh, for beavers now that they're sort of under this designation under the burn convention so it just really kind of strengthens the uh, protection for that uh, for that protected species and thirdly again very different um, this is a regulatory position statement that's been updated uh, on treating municipal waste by aerobic digestion um, so this uh, sets out um, conditions that have to be adhered to if you don't have an environmental permit in place for this type of uh, treated uh, waste activity. I think it's always just worth reminding because the regulatory position statements are published essentially to provide guidance where you don't need an environmental permit. Um, so where you might be you know, approaching uh, the limits or the, the obligations under an environmental permit, these RPSs are put in place to make sure that you are um, doing things like treating waste responsibly and you're adhering to the principles of the legislation or, or permits, um, but doesn't actually obligate you under an environmental permit. So you can find these regulatory position statements simply by typing that into Google and coming up on the um, Gov website. And there are a range of RPSs under things like waste, uh, chemicals, health and safety, um, which are quite useful, uh, you know, if you feel that you're approaching sort of limits or obligations where a permit might come into place. So it helps you just kind of be prepared if that is the direction of travel. Um, so that is really kind of the, the summary of the updates that have happened um, over the last couple of months, really, that are, you know, sort of um, applicable in the environmental uh, setting, but um, not overly relevant to, to businesses for, for this call. So what I'd like to do really is just recap some examples of uh, legislation that are, are in place or coming into place um, that are really supporting uh, the circular economy. So the first of these is the um, plastic packaging tax. So just as a, a reminder, the aim of the tax is to provide an economic incentive to use recycled plastic in the manufacture of plastic packaging. So in turn, that should then create greater demand for that material. Um, and ultimately, hopefully that will then increase levels of recycling and collection of plastic waste. So it's obviously having an environmental benefit, diverting it from landfill and incineration. But it's really kind of starting to support that circular approach to the way that plastic packaging is uh, manufactured. So it applies to um, packaging that is manufactured or imported into the UK um, that doesn't contain at least 30% recycled plastic. So if you've got over 30% recycled plastic, it doesn't apply. Um, plastic packaging is uh, it's classed as packaging when it contains more plastic than anything else. So if you've got a, a mixed composite um, element of packaging, if the plastic part is the, uh, the greatest sort of single substance, then it does overall count as plastic, even if there might be other elements in there like wood or cardboard or, or steel or anything like that. So that came into effect from um, 1st of April, and it applies to those that produce um, or import more than 10 tonnes of packaging in a one year period. And the charge is char uh, the tax is charged at £200 per tonne. So just as a reminder of the kind of the general uh, approach, there's guidance basically on um, checking which packaging is subject to the packaging tax, how to work out the weight uh, of the packaging, how you register to pay for the tax and what records and accounts you have to keep um, as part of your due diligence and how you can then um, uh, claim credit or defer paying tax. So there is new guidance that was issued uh, this month uh, to provide further definition on the um, uh, types of packaging that qualify under the plastic packaging tax. So if you have looked into this already and still need sort of some further guidance on the type of packaging and eligibility, um, definitely worth checking out that new guidance um, on DirectGov, um, which can again simply be found just typing in plastic packaging tax guidance into Google and it does come up as one of the top searches there. So it's a really easy bit of um, guidance to find. Just uh, another example is the uh, extended producer responsibility uh, for packaging. 
So there already was producer responsibility obligations in place, but this has extended that and really it's designed to try and um, support uh, a circular economy uh, where greater quantities of recycled waste are reprocessed. And really, as I'm sure a lot of our speakers will be talking about today, um, it's really about using that to create a high quality secondary resource uh, that can then extend the lifetime of, of the materials that are being utilised. So the current um, producer responsibility obligations start at quite high thresholds. So when you're placing 50 tonnes uh, of uh, packaging on the market um, and have a, a turnover of greater than 2 million, but the extended producer responsibility obligations, they introduce a new lower threshold. So this will be obligating more organisations to report under the producer responsibility obligations. And that brings it down by half, essentially, to 25 tonnes, greater than 25 tonnes and 1 million turnover. So again, you can see the picture there of the uh, guidance documentation if you did want to get more information on it. But essentially, um, what it will do for those organisations that are then obligated, um, so they will then have a, a greater uh, financial incentive to use packaging um, uh, that's uh, collected from sort of recycled content. Um, additional data needs to be published. The data reporting requirements become more complex. Um, got the introduction of uh, modulated fees, so depending on the kind of rates of um, packaging that you're uh, producing, then that could be a much higher amount than it was under the previous uh, scheme. And there is reporting in each of the, the different devolved administrations. So if you are uh, an organisation that operates across those different countries, there could be slightly different obligations for you. And just one further uh, sort of example is the deposit return scheme. So these are used to encourage people to uh, recycle uh, drinks containers and ultimately reduce littering. So obviously having that direct environmental benefit. Um, but essentially it operates on the basis of being charged a small deposit for the uh, the drinks uh, receptacle um, bottle, uh, which consumers then get back when they return the bottle to the collection point. So uh, anyone who retails the materials um, who's obligated under the scheme will have to act as a, a return point. And so it'll be introduced in Scotland in 2023. Um, and I think feedback from recent consultation will outline exactly when it starts in England, but um, it has been delayed uh, somewhat due to COVID. Um, but for what Scotland have confirmed, they've included um, PET bottles, steel and aluminium cans and glass drinks bottles that will be obligated. Um, and it will apply from uh, containers that are 50 millilitres uh, up to three litres and there'll just be a flat 20p deposit for each container. So I'm sure we'll see something similar coming out for, for England in due course. And that is me uh, this morning. So uh, sort of a brief legal update. Um, so hopefully there'll be some more um, exciting and, and relevant legal updates for the next uh, uh, session. But um, if anyone does have any questions, my details are on screen and uh, I'll pass back to, to the next presenter. Thanks very much, Pete. Uh, just before you go, um, I did forget to mention uh, at the start that we will be taking questions in the chat function so if you have any questions for any of our speakers do pop them in there and we will pass them on after each speaker has spoken um gina who is about to talk to us about the circular economy she's got another meeting to go to so um do get your questions in quickly because she won't be able to stay around until the end um for any final discussion so if you've got anything do uh, pop that through just before we hand over i just wanted to ask pete um under the existing packaging regulations, responsibility was kind of shared throughout the chain of utility, if you like, from producers and fillers and then sellers and all that sort of stuff. Am I right in thinking that's now changed with the expensive extended responsibility and it's now more on the actual packaging producer? There is more emphasis on that because that's where you have the kind of the greater control. Um, but there's still a sort of a cascade through the um, if not through the supply chain to kind of pass on some of that obligation. But um, but yeah, a lot more of this kind of really focus on those that are uh, um, having greater control over the, the design and formation of the packaging to make sure that kind of uh, responsibility is taken to really um, sort of take a, a really structured view as to what's required. OK, thanks very much. <laughs> Sorry, just wanted to pop that question in there just for clarity for myself. Um, thank you. So, Gina, over to you. Welcome. <laughs> thank you very much and good morning, everybody. Um, I trust you can now see my screen. Can you confirm that? Yes, we can. See, we can see that. Thank, you. Thank you very much. So I'm an associate professor of operations and supply chain management at Southampton Business School. 
And um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the circular economy today and what it means for businesses. Um, first, a little bit about myself. So I'm actually a manufacturing engineer by training and I'm, I'm very passionate about sustainability and the circular economy. And that shows in various ways, including that I'm now um, the course director of a brand new MSc that we have on strategic operations and supply chain management, where we have a very strong emphasis on training these people, these young minds, for thinking in a way that leads to more sustainability. So they will be future managers, future strategic managers, and they will be very much aware of this need for increasing the sustainability of all the business we do. Um, and then also in, in terms of my research, so I'm the director of the, the Product Returns Research Group at the University of Southampton, where we look into product returns in multi-channel retail. And again, one of our focus points is actually sustainability and this need for inducing, a, introducing a more circular way of doing business. And I, I have a recent publication about this, so where we actually argue that product returns could be an opportunity for shifting towards a more access based economy. So where rather than buying things, we may borrow them, rent them, maybe have a subscription. So there are many different business models that can actually support a more circular economy. Um, and if we just look briefly at the concept itself, so what we have traditionally, of course, is the linear economy where you get raw materials, you make something, you use it and then you throw it away. That is slightly improved then by attempts to, to recycle more materials, but it's still not really that sustainable and it's certainly not circular. In a circular economy, we have a more thorough approach to the whole thing. So there is recycling, of course, but we also approach our business, our design of products, of processes, of services in a way that actually means that they remain in this circle of utility, that they actually don't get thrown out, thrown away. And to get there, that certainly is a, a transition process. So we can't magically jump from a linear economy to a circular economy. There is going to be uh, what some people call the reuse economy, where we just focus on introducing more recycling. But we are still going to use lots of raw materials and we are still going to have lots of non-recyclable waste because our systems are just inherently so unsustainable and just not set up for circularity. So there definitely is going to be a transition process. And we can also see that when we look at product returns. Um, so I've made this, this graphic to kind of show in which way or at which point returned products might actually go back into this circle of utility, as I like to call it. And that can be through reusing items just as they are. They may be donated or they may go back to the retailer and be in pristine condition and go back to the shelf. Or they may be, tar there may be market targeting um, auctions that, that leave lead them to, to new uses. They may be refurbished, remanufactured, recycled. So there are different ways of kind of keeping things inside this circle and making sure they don't get thrown out. Certainly, when we are thinking about businesses, we need to move on from a short term thinking to a long term thinking. So a lot of people will feel that sustainability or trying to achieve circularity is actually in contradiction with this need for profitability. And certainly with large companies, there is always this need to, to satisfy the shareholders and their need for making money right now. Whereas often in smaller companies, you don't have this need and you can actually more easily, hopefully, switch to a more longer term thinking whereby you think about how your actions from today affect the result tomorrow. 
Um, some people also introduce circularity and more sustainability because they're anticipating changes in regulations or, or standards because they are aware that it's going to happen, so better be prepared already. There is also certainly a need from the consumer side, um, especially younger people are increasingly aware of what we are doing to our planet. And as you can see in this survey that I'm citing here, that was published in The Lancet, where they did a, a inter an international survey amongst people between 16 and 25 years of age, and they asked them how they felt about climate change, about the world we live in, and a vast majority of them are really worried and anxious, and they feel sad, guilty, guilty helpless, powerless, anxious, and it really affects their, their daily operations, what they do in their lives. So I think that increasingly the, the need to do something about it is getting stronger and businesses need to, to act on this, really. Um, I want to go a little bit into details of the circular economy as well, or of supply chains, which may be open looped, closed looped or circular. And if you look at the, the graphic on the left side, you can see that, um, well, there, there, is, there are elements of, of collecting, say, plastic bottles, and some of them may, be, may get thrown out. Others may get um, reused, recycled. And then, for instance, in an, in an open loop configuration, they may be, the, these materials may be used to produce clothing or um, a carpet or anything else, a park bench, uh, a brick. And that's great. That's, that's better than throwing them out. It gives them a second, sometimes a third life. But we need to be aware that in this open loop configuration, um, we may actually create items that are then more difficult to recycle again, or that lead to items that or materials, say, um, if you combine plastic with concrete to make building blocks, those building blocks might be nice for a while, but what do you do with them at the end of their life? So sometimes we actually increase the problem if we're not thinking in a systematic way. And again, thinking about what, what's going to, ha going to happen with those recycled items once they reach the end of their second or third life. So in a truly circular economy, we have closed loop supply chains, which means that materials get reused for their original purpose, sometimes by the original manufacturer. So they don't actually get downgraded, but they remain at the level where they can be reused for what they were used in the beginning. And a very rich source for knowledge and information and case studies and examples of companies that are, that are working towards circularity is the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. And um, I've put here some links that can be useful if you want to learn more or if you want to look at examples of big and large and medium and tiny companies that are embracing the circular economy. I'm happy to share my slides as well, by the way, so you can follow all my links. There are quite a few links here. Um, and then I wanted to talk a little bit about ideas for what I guess everybody could do, um, especially SMEs. Maybe not all of you are, are manufacturers, not all of you are actually making physical things, but you could start by thinking about your office. So start wondering about the materials that you're using in your office, the items that you have that goes from electronics to furniture, to lighting, to coffee machines, to uh, the coffee grounds or, or pots that you're using. So often, if we actually go towards this more long term thinking, if we pay a little bit more to get better quality, we have then items that we can use for longer that maybe we can refurbish at some point or we can donate them to somebody else and they get a second lifetime. And I've recently listened to a, a presentation of Fernify in, in a Dutch company, and they're actually specialized in circular um, furniture, so for offices, for galleries, for private households. So all of the items they use are refurbished, uh, refreshed, remanufactured 
and they make them look like um, well designer um, environments. So great ideas, I think. Um, I have here another link um, with ideas and resources specifically for um, small and medium enterprises with quite a lot of ideas for what you can do, how you can get there, how you can reach this circular economy via the recycling economy. Um, and generally, it might mean that you need to start thinking of your company as part of a network. So they, they, where they really implement this is in eco-industrial parks. You may have heard about this before or not. It's essentially where companies, big and large, of very different natures sometimes, they kind of, um, they work together. They see themselves as part of a network that exchanges energy, heat, resources, and what might be the waste or the output or um, a, a secondary product of their production is going to be used as an input for somebody else's production. So by stop, by no longer considering ourselves as just entities in ourselves and seeing us more as part of a, a an ecosystem where we work together with, with other people, that's where we achieve true circularity and where we, we avoid waste that is waste, but rather see those those products or those those substances as actually something valuable. So it's it's all about seeing the value in the in what comes out of what we're doing out of our activities. And in the beginning, I mentioned another idea. So this access based economy um, whereby rather than buying things that we as private persons, as consumers or as small business owners or medium medium sized companies, um, rather than buying things that we, we don't need all of the time, we can actually just borrow them or rent them. It also in, in terms of um, a company, it, it, it relates to this idea of the, the service based economy or service based product model. Um, pro business models, sorry, whereby rather than selling items where you get a one off income, you actually provide a service that uses that product, but you remain its owner and the consumer will pay, say, a monthly fee or an annual fee and where for using it and for being able to use this in good condition, so that whereby the company actually retains the, the ownership and cares for maintenance, repair, upgrading, replacing. So all of that leads to a much more sustainable approach in the end, because we will not have so many products that will get thrown out. It is also in the interest of the manufacturers then to make items that are durable, that can be serviced, maintained, repaired, upgraded, because they're the owner. So they will actually want to design things better. And here are a few examples of companies, different types of companies that all have embraced this circular economy idea. And certainly you have heard about Patagonia, this uh, outdoors clothing company that is entirely circular. They take their things back, they repair them, they reduce the, reuse the materials. And now they're even owned publicly such that um, all they do is for the good of the planet. So I think that's a really good idea. There are also things that are they seem slightly more maybe outlandish at the moment whereby you lease your clothing you lease your jeans um, rather than buying them so we generally need to be well we need to have the courage to explore alternative ideas and see where it might lead us and if you want to get some help with that um, you might want to look at this circular economy handbook by um, Catherine Wheatman. She is also a great a great speaker about the, the circular economy. And she has written this handbook about how to think about circularity, how to how to implement that, what it means, what are, what are the implications. And I actually wrote, um, I think, three pages in this book. So there's a contribution from my side as well. 
And she also has a very good website where she has blogs about a blog about circularity, what it might mean, um, how to how to do it. And for instance, the, the links I provided here is um, um, yeah, for instance, your trash is someone else's treasure. So making use for end of life textiles. There are lots and lots of ideas out there. Um, if you if you dive into this area. Um, yeah, I guess it's about changing our mindset mainly and trying it out. And I'm I'm very happy to take any questions you may have. I can see there are some in the chat. Um, I'm happy for you also to unmute yourselves if you like. Um, happy to have a discussion. So let's see what we got in the chat. Um, so Joe Crocker was saying through Winchester Green Week this year, some of this is emerging in the community swap shop, community wardrobe, repair cafe launch, talks and workshops on reducing pre and post communal textile waste, collaboration between Salvation Army and WSA on fashion design course and sustainable fashion show. How can you imagine the academic and thought leadership on circular economy joining up with the grassroots action on the circular economy? Um, I think it would be great if um, people who are willing to engage in this, so um, organizations, companies, etc. If you if you actually approach us with ideas or with questions, um, a lot of uh, my colleagues and I we are very willing to engage with companies. There are many ways in which we can do that. For instance. Um, um, Innovate UK has funding available in different forms, for instance, in, in KTP grants, so knowledge um, and technology exchange um, partnerships, whereby academics and um, academics and companies work together on developing new ideas, on doing research with the, the aim to uh, create products or services that will then um, help the company do better. And certainly um, the circular economy and sustainability is very high on Innovate UK's ID or, uh, agenda. So if people wanted to do that, please do approach us. We are very willing to, to engage in this and to help you and to, to provide academic input into this. And um, another way in which we, we kind of implement our ideas or bring them to life is that um, sometimes we, we run uh, pilot schemes. So, for instance, the University of Southampton had a, a pilot scheme um, whereby rather than international students, when they come here for a year, all of them, they, they have the same needs. And all of them usually buy a kettle, a toaster, a microwave, bedding. Um, so a number of items that are really, really quite durable um, and that in the end they, they often leave behind and they go to waste. So to avoid this, the university actually has set up a scheme whereby they can, they can pay a fee and essentially rent those things or borrow them. So it's a little bit like a library of things for students, for international students who all need the same items. And uh, I think that's quite a good thing. And it, it really should exist everywhere, shouldn't it? Um, OK, we have another one. Does Southampton University carry out reviews in companies regarding packaging designs and su suitability for, uh, I guess that's recycling, etc.? cetera? Um, I don't know whether we have a dedicated service that does reviews. But certainly, if that's something you're interested in, then please do get in touch. Send me an email and I can um, put you in touch with the right people who are able to do that. We can discuss your needs. Um, also, in, in terms of um, actually, actually packaging and sustainability, the University of Portsmouth is, um, is very well known. So um, they have an entire department who is looking at packaging. Um, again, if you want to get in touch and send me an email, I'm very happy to put you in touch with them, with the, with the specialists for, for packaging. 
Um, what would be my advice for a, a young professional wanting to get more involved in the circular economy space? Um, well, it depends on whether you are a person who is employed in a company or whether you're running your own business or whether you have a business idea that you would like to launch. I think, first of all, it's certainly, um, well, gathering information, so learning more about the circular economy, about the circular principles, about um, what it requires and what it implies. Um, as I mentioned before, a lot of it is about, about our mindsets. It's about um, setting up companies from the out, from the beginning such that they are actually going to be circular. It is much easier to start with a circular business idea and develop that into a successful company than to take a traditional company and try to make it circular because you will have a lot more resistance. You will have a lot more of the, the set mindset and thinking and processes that are not circular, not sustainable. It certainly can be done. It needs to be done. Um, but often it's easier to start from scratch. So to, to take an idea and think about how how can I make this circular and then to launch it. And again, you can get in touch with us. We have also structures at the university whereby we help um, spin off companies or, or startup companies develop their ideas. We can help them with office spaces, with advice. Um, I think there are funding schemes as well where you can get a little bit to, to uh, support to start your business idea. So yeah, get in touch if you have an idea and would like to do something. And then we have another question. Apart from universities and businesses, who are the other agents of change to enable the shift in mindset you talk about and to help people feel courageous to try new patterns of living? Uh, I think an, element, an important element as well are, are policy makers. So it's the, the rules and regulations that, that need to change and that are very slowly changing. Um, we have heard from Peter before me about rules changing. Um, so I think that is actually very important as well. So not, not all businesses are going to change voluntarily. Um, some of them will have to be forced. So I think that's, that's quite an important element. Then also the media play a role. Um, the more we read about the climate emergency, about plas the plastic disaster we have in the oceans and how it affects our world, the more people become aware, I hope, the more people are willing to change. Um, certainly also, say, supermarkets play a role because um, a lot of people wish to do something but in the end, they're well. They have to buy their groceries from the supermarket, and they're under economical pressure to buy. Well, not not everybody can afford so organic and sustainably produced things. So I think supermarkets and producers also have quite a a big responsibility in in a, enabling the normal consumer to actually be more sustainable. So we need to we need to rethink packaging and a lot of them we need and 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 all that comes with it so not just the packaging the, the way things are made the way they are presented the way they're transported where they come from and a lot of it will only happen through through pressure so i think consumer organizations um are certainly very important there are also ngos that are acting in in this field like rap um, Wrap UK, if you want to look that up, if you're not familiar. Um, so there, there are a lot of actors that play a role in changing people's mindsets and also changing the rules under which companies operate. And as I said before, um, rather than waiting until the rules have changed, it is actually good to be proactive and try to change it voluntarily before you're forced to. Then we have another question or comment. Plastics are very hard to recycle through curbside and supermarket return schemes are a big problem for the retailers or there is no reliable way to manage the materials. How do you think local authorities and recycling centres can truly adapt to provide recycling that works? 
particularly with the apparent watering down of the Environment Act at the moment. Yes. Yeah. Um, it relates to the to what I said before that um, recycling is actually not enough. Recycling is not the solution. And we have also seen that in um, I, I've, I'm involved in um, a big research project on plastics recycling across the UK, France, Netherlands and Belgium. And we have been looking at ways to um, reduce those lost plastics in our urban urban environments. So where we we have recycling centers, we have recycling services, but a lot of the plastics still don't get recycled. And we have been working on ways to improve this or, or innovative ways of collecting plastics and what to do with them. So not just collecting for the sake of collecting and then not knowing what to do with it, but actually having this fundamental of idea of where is it going to go? What are you going to do with those materials afterwards? And um, it's difficult. And we have certainly come to the to the insight as well that we need to rethink packaging, we need to rethink single use plastics. So rather than thinking only about how to improve recycling, we need to to find ways to actually avoid making them in the first place. We need to redesign our products, redesign our services such that they do not produce so much waste. Um, but of course, as I said, recycling is part of it. And I, yes, I do think that uh, pyrolysis is, is a solution, is, no, sorry, it's not a solution. It's one of the tools we are using or we should be using more on this path. There is also research into, um, um, say, worms or bacteria that can digest plastics. So that's all great and very helpful and we should do better. Definitely in the UK, there is a big need for coordinating recycling and waste treatment. Um, we have found um, surprising things, shocking things, really. In certain cases, we have actually um, recycling facilities in the UK that have the technical capability and the capacity to recycle more. So, for instance, more of these uh, drink cartons like Tetra Packs. We have these facilities and they're underused. So they're running under capacity because what we lack is a certain coordination between councils, between regions, because everybody is doing their own thing. And there is there is not enough um, oversight in checking where are the capabilities and the capacities and how do we organize them? So also often locally, um, if there is capacity, it doesn't necessarily get used. Sometimes our waste, our, res or our plastic waste that should be recycled gets shipped across the country or gets shipped to third countries rather than using our own capability and building it up, also building up the capacity. So there, there needs to be a lot more coordination. And we, we do think that we need to have more of these um, processing centers that have um, the capability to deal with a, a number of different plastics because different plastics in different conditions need different treatments. So we should have built them up re in regionally that they have all the capabilities and the right capacity. And then we need to force the councils to actually use that. Um, you are saying we are monitoring this as well. What is the latest status? Um, I imagine pyrolysis is, is meant here. Um, so the last time I checked, which was a few months ago, to be honest, is um, that yes, it works. And um, there are companies building such facilities also in the UK. Um, I, I I, well, I looked into one company, I think they were Spanish, um, and they have a, a big uh, operational plant in Spain and they were in the process of building one in the UK. So I'm aware of some plants, also other ones, being developed. But um, And what shocked me really is that um, when you look into this discussion, some of the councils in the UK, some of the politicians in the UK have issues 
with um, building such facilities and using them. Also waste incineration facilities, which can take in such materials and harvest the energy you get from burning the materials uh, and harvest it, capturing the CO2, which overall is a much better than solution than landfill. Yet some of the councils and politicians actually favor landfill. So it's, some of this is really puzzling. And uh, it certainly needs a lot more work with, with these people, with these decision makers. And uh, yeah, somebody agrees that councils and the planning system is a real issue. Yeah, I, I think we need to address this. I don't know how, sorry. <laughs> but uh, I do look forward to hopefully getting a, a few emails from, from companies who want to be more circular, more sustainable, and we can explore what we can do together. We have a lot of knowledge, a lot of information, um, and we, we are very happy to work with companies on this. We, we currently have one of these, actually, we are setting up a KTP for a more sustainable international product returns. But I have a lot of colleagues active in in similar related fields. I can put you in touch with them. So please send me an email and uh, let's talk about what we can do. Thank right. you very Thank much. Thank you very listening. much, Gina. Um, I know you've got to go off to another meeting, but it's just like I say, on behalf of the group, thank you very much. Um, obviously, if we, if we were in person, there'd be a massive round of applause at this point, but that was really informative and some thank great you. questions and some great discussion there as well. So thank you very much. Um, as we said, you know, all the slides will be available afterwards, so including Gina's email. So if you do want to get in touch, uh, that will be hopefully fairly straightforward. So thank you very much. We'll let you get on. Thanks, um, everybody. Thank you. And now, Steve, um, you have the exciting task of trying to follow that. Um, so if you can try and grab the screen with your presentation, that would be great. Thank you very much. Yep, we can see that. Thank you very much, Duncan. Thank, thank you, Gina. That was, that was great. Um, I'm here as, as a guest of Wendy and, and the network, and I would like to thank you all for just spending or investing a bit of time to, to see me present today. Uh, I'm uh, Steve Haskew. I'm the Director of Sustainability at Circular Computing. We're based in Portsmouth. Uh, we have a global supply, however, so we're uh, an SMB, uh, but on the, on the, the medium side of SM. Uh, so let's jump into this then. Here we go. OK, so I, I start my presentations talking about sustainability uh, and within sustainability, we talk about numbers. We talk about very big numbers because there are very big issues to tackle planetary problems. And we talk about very small numbers uh, in the context of, of this guy. This guy's called Cristiano Ronaldo. He plays currently for Man United. He wears number seven. Uh, I saw him play at the end of last season against my team, Brighton. They lost 4-2 and they lost recently this season again to us. So when I saw him play last season, I, I recognised that actually it might be the last time that I see him play. And then it made me start thinking about, OK, well, what, what does this guy have as a responsibility in the themes of sustainability? Some of you might not know that actually he has the largest following on Instagram. He comes from Portugal, there's 10 million people, yet he has half a half a billion uh, followers on Instagram. Now, there are probably about 5 billion people who are mobile, so he has a reach of 10% of that global network, which is something. And to frame what that feels like in terms of the environmental uh, um, uh, output of his action, every time he makes a post into his network, it uses a, a colossal amount of energy. And that is the, the equivalent energy that would be used for 19 houses uh, for a year here in the UK. Yet he posts um, 1.7 times a day. Uh, so the energy that he accumulates with his activity is the thick end of 21 million watt hours, which is uh, 1,100 houses for a year. Yet he he has a commercial um, benefit of so doing. Um, but that that just made me kind of think about things slightly differently because. The, um, the centre of the circular economy is, is remanufacturing. We are a remanufacturer and we believe that a decarbonised future state cannot exist without remanufacturing and the circular economy within it. And I'll, and I'll explain why shortly. But we use carbon net zero as a, as a, as a focal point predominantly because everybody's speaking about it. And as such, we can then draw all of the other things along with it, like resource scarcity, overconsumption, affordable goods and so forth. 
Um, if we if we get the carbon conversation right, then everything else is affected and um, the circular economy can become a thing. We have seen a great wondrous advancement. If you can hear that, can someone give me a thumbs up? Decades. They got faster. They got smaller. They got lighter. Until we reached a point where they were only getting a little bit faster and only a little bit smaller. But by this point, we had become master consumers. Through habit, we wanted new. And we got really, really good at throwing things away. We got so good at throwing computers away that we break new records year after year. In the EU alone, 160,000 laptops are thrown away every day. About 70% of them could be recycled. Less than 20% are. On average, it takes 190,000 litres of water to make just one new laptop. It produces 316 kilograms of carbon dioxide and 1200 kilograms of the Earth's precious resources are mined. Ten years ago, we saw the technology plateau take effect. We started thinking, what if we could remanufacture a laptop to be like new? In 2017, we built a state-of-the-art dedicated remanufacturing facility and over the years, we have defined and refined the processes to get us where we are today. So where are we today? We remanufacture laptops that look and act like new. We have an RMA of less than 3%. We can create thousands of the same model to the same consistent quality with no discernible difference. And to confirm our standards of quality, in 2021, British Standards Institute awarded a kite mark of quality assurance for our circular remanufacturing process. The kite mark confirms our laptop's product stock is equal to or better than the original. Not using new avoids a huge carbon footprint. In addition to this, we also pledge to plant five trees for every laptop we sell. It's a viable alternative to new. It's the advancement this industry and our world has been waiting for. Circular computing, because IT shouldn't cost the earth. Okay, so that that that's that's a little bit about about what we what we are and who we are. Uh, we we took the approach to the market of we'll build it and everyone comes, which was a little bit risky uh, and and a little bit kind of what Gina was saying that is it consumer led or is it supplier led. Uh, we took the initiative to to invest all our, our stakeholder funds in our factory and, and, and go for it seven years ago. Uh, but we recognise that the consumer wouldn't buy secondhand tech. Everybody uses a laptop, everybody uses a mobile phone. And so everybody appreciates that somewhere in their existence is a drawer full of obsolete tech that, that they've um, they put there. Um, and the larger the organisation, the more the more relevance this, this kite mark has, because you can go into Amazon and eBay and buy one um, one second-hand laptop refurbished, a pretty good, pretty good version. But if you're, say, a large organisation, a, a consultancy like Price Waterhouse Coopers, they might have a quarter of a million laptops. That then kind of shifts the balance. To make the big impacts, we need to um, impact or, or enable the large, um, the large organisations to make positive buying decisions that then it have an impact towards uh, resource preservation and, and climate. And this, uh, this kite mark enables them to do that with laptops um, and our factory currently has the ability to output 20,000 units a month uh, we're currently kind of run rate at about 10,000 units a month and that's that's been slowly building over the last 12 months or so since we received this kite mark but this kite mark took um, seven years to get so the key drivers in the IT industry one uh, was leaving uh, the European Union the environment bill was written and, and signed by uh, T Theresa May and uh, and others in, in parliament and government is trying to get its teeth into it because it realizes that it needs um, it needs to kind of crack on. 
over and above climate net zero, there's a critical mineral strategy. And the reason there is that, I'll explain in a moment, that, that will enable us to build back better. Uh, and by building back better, we can affect these things. And of course, COP26 last, last uh, November, um, they signed a legally binding ag agreement, global agreement that helps them point towards these, what they call NDCs, which is uh, the reduction in carbon. But then you think about um, those nine or 10 months ago, so much has happened in the, in the, the social and political scene. You know, COVID has stopped. There's been a war in the, in, in Russia with the, in, in the Ukrainian situation, the cost of living crisis. You know, a pound was a pound last year. It's now worth 85p. In fact, it's worth 80p today. It was 85p on Monday. So the government are putting in these 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 uh, these these things into departments. As of yesterday, find ways to save money to procure more eff efficiently, and we believe that uh, we might be well positioned to help them achieve that. Uh, in terms of the public sector. If they get it right, then I believe industry will follow. So what the public sector and the government are saying is, as a for instance, if you cannot demonstrate a carbon reduction plan um, for um, for your organisation, then we won't uh, we won't allow you to supply our our organisation, and, and that being the, the public sector PLC, if you like. Um, but these are the things that the 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 um, uh, DEFRA have put on the table. And they want to see a yearly increase in, in remanufactured devices. Again, that, that is a, a perfect position for us. So I just want to really quickly reflect on why we have the problem. And this is this is the, the reason why people want to speak to us today. So 72, there's 3.9 billion people. Marvin Gaye's banging about what's going on. Um, we've we raced forward some years, and here we are 50 years on, and the population of the planet has doubled. The problem, though, is there's two x growth in population and that itself is is hard enough for the for the planet to to, to cope with yet we have three x consumption and that is actually really causing a uh, a hangover that's looming and that's what we're trying to help fix and we're on course for 10 billion 10 billion people the reason the circular economy is important is there's just not enough stuff to go around we'll talk about that so that's the linear economy um, take, make, use, dispose. It is the bipolar opposite of how nature works. There is there is zero waste in nature, um, and in fact, there's zero waste in our organisation. We see it as next generation resources. We're trying to align ourselves with 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 nature based thinking. Um, yet this, particularly within technology, is a habit that we have to break. And if we don't break it, then we're on a path to to ruin. Um, and this. This slide helps me helps me sort of explain that what we're looking at here is something called Earth Overshoot Day. If you have a look at Jamaica, if the world lived like Jamaica does, that will be pretty cool. So Jamaica consumes pretty much every everything it needs for the year and um, the, the world's are able to regenerate the resources for the next year within reason. But if you have a look at that orange dot there and if the world lived like the United Kingdom, then by May the 19th, we would have uh, used up all of the resources that the planet could give. So effectively, what we're doing is we are we are mortgaging the future of um, what the world can give for the benefit of today, which is uh, which is the opposite end of what sustainability means. If you if you have a look at the Oxford Dictionary. And that's represented here. So if the world carries on consuming like the UK, we're going to need two and a half times planet to feed ourselves, which is obviously not sustainable, or find a systematic way to use what has already been made to uh, to the benefit of the planet. So if we have a quick look at what makes up a laptop, um, I'm going to pick out out of this palladium uh, just because it has a relevance with what's going on in, in, in the Ukraine and Russia. Uh, palladium is a critical, um, a critical mineral uh, that is on a motherboard. Uh, if you think about anything that has a has a circuit board, which is a, a watch, mobile phone, laptop, it could be solar, hydro, wind, it could be electric vehicles, it could be a non-electric vehicles. They too have circuit boards. So everything that a laptop has is also required by other products in the market and, and an increasingly wide uh, number of products in that market as well. Yet palladium, 45 percent of that comes from Russia. We now have a trade embargo with Russia, meaning that there's 55% left in the places where we can shop. Um, but the price of that has gone up and we only had to look at back at COVID to, to realise that 
supply chain uh, vulnerability is a real issue. Um, and so what we are trying to do is help organizations build resilience into their procurement by the adoption of a remanufactured device. Um, this is actually quite interesting. It help, help, helps, me, helps me sort of talk about the, the carbon effect of, of a laptop. Uh, there's 316 kilos of CO2 uh, produced um, by, by the procurement of a new laptop. So the majority of um, the, uh, the negative output comes at production. Um, and when I, when I thought about that, then I, I started thinking about, OK, well, what can I do to, to further explore that? We work in the circular economy. It's regenerative, it designs out waste and pollution, and it keeps products and materials in use for as long as it possibly can. Uh, and like Gina said, you know, dip into Alan MacArthur. There's a whole wealth of knowledge in in that organisation, and we align to, the, to their way of thinking. So in terms of a, of a coordinated approach, I think it's important that the the syntax and lyrics, the linguistics contained within what we're trying to achieve, are easy for consumer to understand. So then it made me think about, OK, well, where, where is everybody focused when they're talking about, about um, net, net zero carbon? They'd be right to be thinking about the transportation of stuff and the powering of stuff. That's what the media and the politicians talk about all day, every day. You know, invest in, invest in wind, solar, hydro, um, invest in electric vehicles. It's really great. For net zero, that's, that's, that's probably true. But that stuff needs to be made. And 31 percent of, of um, uh, CO2 output or greenhouse gas emissions comes from the making of stuff, which includes cement and steel. So to make a, a ton of steel, the output of that is a, a ton of CO2. To make a ton of cement, you get 1.8 ton of CO2. To make three laptops is a ton of CO2. And we go back to that number again, it's one, it's one ton, but what does it actually mean? So one ton in layman's terms is 19,000 cubic feet in an air mass. Again, that doesn't mean anything to anybody. And so the, the science says that 19,000 cubic feet will fit into a three bedroom house. So if you make three laptops and then you replace them with brand new ones every three to four years, then what you're doing by default is setting off a three bedroom house of air, if you think of it like that, into the Earth's atmosphere that's working against the, um, the needle of, of, of net zero climate. Uh, and we avoid that event happening. I then looked at the SDGs, which hopefully people on the call will know about, just to sort of make sense of the previous slide, which comes from scientists, and then this kind of leans into, what well, is the United Nations aligned with that way of thinking? So I, I look at this and go, well, actually, if it is true that the number 12, which is sustainable production and consumption, so we sit in number 12, how aligned to climate, act, to climate action and climate change are we? Well, I would say very, and it's fair to say then that if we were able to affect number 12, the number 13 comes along for the ride. And I, and I believe there will be change over there as well. So we say we say that production um, is, is uh, the cause of a lot of uh, CO2, and therefore reuse is the way to, um, to, to help sort of dampen that. Um, and then remanufacturing for the consumer is a way that they can get a product that's equal to or better than new um, via an industrial process uh, that, that helps them um, associate what they're trying to do from a procurement point of view with what they're actually doing. Um, and, and working with Wendy at Carbon, Carbon Footprint has helped us to, to shape our, our methodology and our thinking, and our, our customers are actually able to uh, communicate this to their wider stakeholders, that, that they are committed to net zero, and the ICT as a, as a work stream is helping them achieve that. So just dipping into what is sustainable IT, really, you've got acquisition, so are you buying your product from a sustainable, uh, a sustainable uh, provider? Um, that's the first question. The second one is, are you buying renewable energies to power that device? And then the third one is, well, what do you do with the device once you've taken the value you, you want out of it uh, for, for next gen resource? So there are systems within IT, particularly within the laptop market, that, that are available for this to happen. Um, and what we're hoping is that is that people can learn how we do this from a reverse logistics point of view and then adopt that in, in wider thinking. 
Let me just fl fly through that. So we've got 70,000 units out in the field. Um, it's produced uh, it, it, it's, it's produced a massive reduction in CO2. The water saving is 190,000 litres of water required to mine, uh, refine, smelt and, and build a laptop from, uh, from, from the earth to the desk it's used. Um, which is not a, not a problem if you're in the UK and you turn the tap on and water comes out. But if you're in a place you have to walk 10 miles to get a dirty bucket of water to feed the family, believe me, that really is a, a thing. Um, and I think that the main the main thing here is that we're able to produce a product that is cheaper um, economically than the cost of a new one. It's more resilient in terms of the, the, the volatility of, of price. And also it comes along with a whole host of, of other sustainability benefits so that the value creation that we are able to put into the market um, is so much more than what is otherwise available that once the customers kind of get the ta-da moment, which is, which is a learning and a journey, they really do buy in. And so if we have a quick look at who we work with, um, these organisations have come on board in the last 12 months. Um, they the clients we have are part of a collaborative network. They believe in what we believe in, we believe in what they believe in, and we have a very transparent uh, relationship. So picking one or two out here, the East of England Ambulance Service are a fantastic client. They often come into webinars with me to say why they work with us. When you, when you, when you dial a 999 in, in the East of England, it's our kit that answers the phone. So when we're speaking to new customers, we can reference them as a, well, unless your your needs are more important than life and death, I, I can suggest that my products are are fit for the purpose. And also the Royal Mint, you know, there are there are things that we can't remanufacture, like circuit boards that are beyond economic repair, for, for instance. Uh, the Royal Mint is a customer that uses our laptops um, as part of their operation, but also they have just invested in a smelting factory. So the stuff that we can't remanufacture will go to their smelting. They'll take off the, the the gold and silver, the valuable stuff off the motherboard, and that will go into their their jewellery line. Um, and you can buy their jewellery from their web shop. So that's pretty cool as well. Um, and that and that's me really. Listen, thank you everybody for allowing me the opportunity to uh, to speak today. If you have any questions, then then please fire them in, or um, you can pick up with me after the event through uh, through Wendy. Thanks, Steve. That's uh, uh, that's really impressive. Um, it's it's great to hear that you're out there, and uh, I hope that we will all be talking to our IT managers as soon as we get back to the office and saying, "Hey, look, we should be buying these." Good, um, thank you. We, we haven't had any questions pop up in the chat, um, but if anyone thinks of anything immediately after Steve's gone, um, then I think your contact details were on your slides on the front slide, so you can look at back at those on the um, carbon footprint website and pick up with him afterwards. Um, thank you. Oh, hang on, a question has popped up. Um, just from Andrew asking whether you take all IT waste or is it specifically no. laptops? <laughs> Yeah, no, no, we don't. E-waste is a massive growing, uh, growing uh, waste stream, Duncan. So no, we don't personally, but we have a network within our network that, that can help, definitely. Okay, jolly good. So there you go. Questions to Steve and he'll put you in touch. <laughs> okay, so if there are no more questions, then I'm just going to run through what we do at Marwell and what... Um, if you're an end user, you're a user of a product as opposed to... Um, you know, a manufacturer or a remanufacturer or a recycler. Where is where do you fit into this sort of circular economy um, cycle? Uh, and what's your role and what is your responsibility in terms of obviously looking to what you're purchasing and then getting what you have used back into the cycle rather than it ending up in a bin somewhere? Um, so we've seen various versions of this um, slide. Uh, so I won't go into too much detail, but that's us in the middle. We're primarily a consumer of goods um, obviously we've got a little retail section so we are selling things to other people but we're primarily a user and so we need to make sure that we are putting stuff back into the cycle of reuse rather than dropping it out the bottom um, so obviously we've just heard um, about circular computing so there's a product that we could be buying um, that we know has already been used it's been refurbished and, it's, um, and we can now get a second use out of it. And there are more and more of these products that are available now. Um, anybody who's got a large sort of printer copier has probably got it on a lease and it's being refurbished and repaired periodically. Uh, and that's been going on for years in that sort of market. And there are more examples 
increasingly on the market of office furniture. Gina mentioned earlier um, that you can get refurbished, you can give it back and they dismantle it and repair it and then sell it to somebody else. There are more examples around and in clothing particularly, Gina mentioned Patagonia and Mud and locally on the Isle of Wight, there's a company called Rapa Nui. And these are all organisations that will take stuff back um, and they'll either do it, take it back for repair, like Patagonia and Mud, or in Rapa Nui's case, if you're end of life, they'll take it back and make sure it's getting recycled. So these exist in the market, but there still probably aren't enough of those examples around for us to be purchasing only second use items. So what we need to think about is all the items that we do buy, if we haven't got that take back option already, what can we do to make sure that we're not part of that leakage? and that our materials, once we've finished with them, are not just ending up in energy recovery and landfill. And as Gina mentioned, recycling is not necessarily enough, but at the moment it might be all we've got. So we need to make sure that what we're doing is putting everything back in a condition where it can be reused to its best possible um, effect. Um, so that's a picture of one of our skips at Marwell. And you can see that our segregation isn't as good as it should be. Um, there's a few bits of cardboard in there. But equally, the stuff in there that are made of materials that might be recyclable if the recycler exists. And obviously, there's a big sink unit there, which I think is made of polypropylene. Um, and that's a material that is theoretically recyclable, but actually getting it to a recycler is really difficult. They're not necessarily established um, collection chains and that sort of thing. So when it comes to our purchasing decisions, when we're installing something like that, a sort of slightly more unusual unit, we can think about what's it made of that would make it easier to recycle or reuse at the end of its life. And perhaps if we'd installed a steel or an aluminium sink, um, it, might, it might last longer, um, but it might also, it's obviously readily recyclable in our metal skip to the left there, um, or it could go straight back into a reuse somewhere else. So those purchasing choices, everything in that skip is something we bought um, and we've now thrown it away. So that purchasing choice up front of how, what did we buy, what was it made of, could have prevented this skip existing at all. So we need to think about the whole cycle in that purchasing um, process. And we started doing it a little bit. I think I've shared these sort of products with some of the group before. On the left, um, all our soft toys are now made from recycled plastic bottles. Uh, and we've also got some toys that are made out of um, bioplastics. And they're a step in the right direction, but the plastic toys are not themselves recyclable. Uh, so where Gina talked about, you know, taking um, the plastic bottles and recycling them into clothing, which then could get down, sort of downcycled essentially into something like a brick or a bench, you are losing quality as you recycle. And so everything just ends up as waste, but maybe after a couple of uses, it's not truly circular. Um, so we need to think about that material and its disposal. This was a partial success story. So earlier this year, we replaced all the tables and chairs in our cafe. And we thought, right, well, these are, they're a little bit tatty, which is why we're replacing them, but they are functional. They're quite robust. So maybe, you know, a school could use them or a, um, like a works canteen or something like that. So we contacted a local company, um, the Recycled Assets Company in Portsmouth and said, look, you know, can you find a second use for these? If you think you could sell them on? And they were able to. They took all those off our hands and they did actually find a second use for them. Um, I'm not entirely sure who it was, but they came back to us and said, actually, we've managed to get another use for about 80 percent of them. But when we took them all out of the building, some of them were stored outside in the rain. So a number of those chairs, unfortunately, ended up getting broken down for recycling because we hadn't stored them properly to enable them to be properly reused. So when we're thinking about our position in the circular economy, how we present materials for reuse is really important. So we've got to maintain the quality of the goods if we want them to then be used by somebody else. We can't rely on somebody else doing a massive refurbishing job. If we can keep it in as good a quality as possible, when it comes to the end of our useful life, somebody else doesn't have to do too much work to then turn it back into a useful product. Um, so if we just chucked a tarpaulin over the top of them when they were stored, that would probably have done the job. So it's relatively easy things that can just make your product more reusable. Obviously, Steve's just been talking about IT waste and laptops. Um, we don't get a huge amount of IT waste, but we, but we do get a lot of electrical waste. And our electrical recycler, they have something like a 93% reuse rate. But all of the stuff that is reused is IT. 
in the rest of the electronics sector, it's more about recycling. There's not a lot of reuse. So industry does need to catch up for this to work um, on a functioning scale throughout all the different products on the marketplace. Um, so most of our electrical waste does end up broken down for components and materials recycling as opposed to reuse. And that's kind of disappointing, but their infrastructure just doesn't exist at the moment to try and form a reuse, um, a repair and reuse function for a lot of this type of waste. And admittedly, the nature of our business, we don't throw something away until it really is knackered. So it would be a lot of effort to repair and refurbish it, um, even if the cycles did exist. But again, thinking about how you separate and store that material might enable it to be uh, reused more effectively uh, at a later date. And then there's really simple stuff. Um, so on the left is the cardboard skip we used to have, uh, and it all went off for recycling. But because it was an open skip, it all got a bit wet. And so the quality of the cardboard that went for recycling actually wasn't terribly good. So we've now switched to a closed skip, and it means our cardboard is now dry and it's much more easy to recycle um, and it becomes much more attractive to the recycler. And that's obviously saving us money because because the carrier can get more money for the cardboard. They don't charge us for it at all. Um, if you're a bigger organisation with lots of cardboard, you can get a baler and you can probably then sell that cardboard. But it's really important that you keep it in as good a quality as possible, which then enables the recycler to do something with it as easily as possible. And everyone retains value in the cycle. And similarly, we have a wood skip. Um, some of the wood that we throw out might actually be reusable. But actually, again, the nature of our business, um, most of our wooden products are outside. Um, and so they're, they're damp and they're degraded and they're dirty. And actually, the majority of our wood waste is going for chipping and energy recovery. Um, but if you're in a sort of business where you are getting sort of clean and reusable wood out of a um, as offcuts, or if you've had some some demolition work done and you've got you know rafters and beams, if you've ever got good quality wood coming out, if you take it separate from your rubbish essentially, um, then that can be reused. So there's a segregation piece of work to be doing to say right, can we keep good quality stuff separate from stuff that's going to have to go for energy recovery. So our sorting processes need to be good enough that we can put stuff back into the cycle of reuse um, without mixing it with stuff that really isn't suitable for reuse. And obviously, in our case, as a visitor attraction, we can encourage uh, reuse in our um, in our market and in our guests. So things like getting people to bring their own mugs when they want a cup of coffee instead of using a takeaway mug. Obviously, if they're sat in the cafe, then they can use a china mug. But if they're walking around the zoo, we'd much rather they were walking around with a reusable mug of their own than a takeaway paper mug that might get recycled, but obviously can't be reused. And likewise, you can bring your own drinking water bottle and fill that rather than buying a plastic one. Um, so just lastly, thinking about how we implement this throughout the organization, we have a sustainable purchasing procedure. And so that includes bits about the choices you make and the life cycle of the products and is it reusable, is it easily recyclable and all those sorts of questions. But we've also made some changes over the years to our waste management. So when I started at Marwell, I created a waste management procedure and it's great and it detailed, you know, the different streams for all our waste and some of it went for recycling and some of it went for energy recovery. And then a few years ago, we thought actually, you know, we ought to be focusing more on the recycling and the minimization of the waste. So we changed the focus of the procedure and it became minimization and recycling. And then most recently, we've now got rid of waste altogether. I say that what we're talking about is not waste. It's not something we're going to throw away. It's a material that should be reused or recycled. So we've changed the focus of that document so that anybody in the organization knows they're not throwing something away. They're putting it out for reuse or recycling. And that's quite a new change. So it's going to take a while to embed that through the organization. We want to, I took out something like 140 references to waste from the whole procedure. I said, no, none of it is waste. It's all the material that could be reused if we can treat it correctly. And the next evolution might be to not have a material collection or a waste procedure at all. And actually, this is part of our purchasing procedure. And how we handle our materials at the end of our use of them is part of our purchasing choice. Um, and that's a 
an evolution that I'm considering at the moment. Bit tricky on our side because obviously we get a lot of guest waste um, or materials that could be reused, um, and that's not affected by our purchasing. Um, but for other organisations who don't have all that external material coming into their organisation, you might want to think about getting rid of your waste or recycling procedures and say, no, that material handling is part of our purchasing decision and take a completely fresh approach to how you handle materials at the end of your use of them. And I think that's me. So just a very quick overview of how we're dealing with it and how you might want to start thinking about it differently. Uh, I shall come back here. I don't know if anyone's had any questions. Um, I think Steve is still here um, and Pete as well. So if anyone had any last questions, do pop them in the chat. And we've got nothing immediately leaping up. I'll give you another two seconds, but if no one has any questions, then we'll wrap up for today. And I hope you're all going to rush off and see some of the other Green Week events this afternoon and tomorrow. OK, then I think that will probably do us. So don't forget the feedback forms if you haven't done it already. Do jot your note, thoughts down on that and also the survey around other events you'd like to see from the group. Uh, and we will try and facilitate those, uh, I guess, probably into next year now. <laughs> uh, and don't forget the next event on biodiversity coming up uh, in November or the Climate Assembly on the 22nd of October. So thank you very much.